started a verse-by-verse -verse study through the uh, minor prophet of Habakkuk. I'll give you guys a second to turn there. It can be kind of a tricky one to find because it's a tiny little book wedged in there in the Old Testament. We passed the major prophets of uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. And then you can start mowing through those smaller ones. All right, Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2 is where we're going to be tonight. And as kind of a recap uh, from last week, if you remember, uh, a lot of people put this book in time period, uh, probably just after the reign of Josiah. There was a great uh, revival in the kingdom in Judah after Josiah, uh, him just returning to uh, the, the uh, word of God and uh, after that, there was a sharp decline right before uh, that God would put them into the Babylonian captivity by the Chaldeans, which we saw last week that there was prophecy of in this uh, book of Habakkuk. And so that's kind of like the time frame of where this book is. And if we remember from last week, we saw that this book is unique in that it's uh, given us a conversation a conversation between uh, God and Habakkuk. Uh, chapter 1 started with Habakkuk uh, crying out to God, crying out for the violence and everything, that the sin that was all around him. And uh, God answered him and said that he had seen all that and that he was going to do a thing. He was going to do something that, that even if they heard, they wouldn't believe. And he, that's when he prophesied and gave them that uh, that the judgment that he was going to bring upon them by bringing the Chaldeans uh, to execute judgment there on Judah, on Israel. And then we have Habakkuk ending the chapter, kind of asking why, why God would use a heathen nation, so a nation that would be even more unrighteous than they were, uh, to bring judgment upon them. And that's kind of uh, where we pick up because him and asking God that question and going back and forth, it kind of goes into chapter 2, verse 1. And so let's uh, start there in chapter 2, verse 1. Let's just read, uh, starting off the first four verses. We probably are only going to get through those maybe tonight. So uh, in verse 1, it says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me. And this is Habakkuk speaking. And what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me, and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. And so as we said, Last week, you know, we see Habakkuk and picking up at the end of the chapter, he's asking God uh, kind of why, why he would judge them in this way, why he would uh, use the Chaldeans. Uh, and in verse one, he says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And, you know, the first thing we see is uh, just the expectation of Habakkuk. You know, this godly man, he's asking God questions. And instead of thinking, you know, I'm, I'm never going to know. God's not going to answer me. Or, you know, I'm just, you know, this is a foolish exercise. Uh, he says, you know what? I'm just going to, I don't understand this, but I'm just going to set on my watch and I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait for the Lord to answer. I'm going to wait for the Lord to reprove me. And you can see what uh, just faith and what. Uh, kind of relationship he has with the Lord to just expect that he's going to get answers, uh, that he can just wait for him. And really that's that attitude that we should all have uh, when we turn to God, especially with any prayer requests and things, is that we should expect that God, he's a loving father. Uh, he's, he loves us. He loves us more than we can know, and, and he wants more for us more than we think. And so when we ask God questions and we have serious requests to bring to God, uh, is that our expectation? Do we expect, like the godly man Habakkuk, that we're going to get an answer? You know, he had that expectation, and, and so should we. 
uh, when we pray to God. God wants us to ask him things. Um, and you see what he says there. He says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. You see, Habakkuk, he's not understanding why God would bring about this judgment, why God would do things the way that he's doing. He doesn't quite understand it. He's questioning it. But yet, he's not folding up his hands and quitting. Right? He's not giving up. Uh, he's not turning away. He's not uh, questioning God to the point where he doubts God. He says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to stay upon my watch. And, you know, that's, the, again, the attitude that we ought to have, too. You know, there's going to be many times uh, when we're not going to fully understand what God's doing. Uh, there's going to be many times when we may question, uh, God, why are you allowing this in my life? Why are you bringing it? Uh, why are you allowing those people around me to, to prosper when they uh, seem so openly wicked? Why, why are you allowing all this happen? You know, we all might have those times in our life where we question and ask why. Uh, but we need to just stay upon our watch. As a backup, because as the children of God, we all have a watch. Uh, he has set us here. He's left us here uh, to be a watchman. And I think this attitude that Habakkuk has is great that he's just said, you know what? I don't get this, but I'm going to stay upon my watch until the Lord reproves me. Until he tells me, you know, where I'm going wrong here, I'm just going to stay on my watch. I'm going to stay uh, to what, I, what I'm supposed to be doing. And, you know, do we realize that, you know, we're here as watchmen, that we have a watch. Uh, you know, now that I've become a pastor, that's uh, something that is a little bit more, um, you know, daunting for me is that, you know, I'm set here to be a watchman. You know, that I uh, need to be preaching the word of God. I need to be sounding the trumpet. And if I'm not, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to. Uh, to speak more about that, let's go to uh, Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 33, another Old Testament book. Ezekiel 33. We speak about Habakkuk being a watchman, setting on his watch. Ezekiel 33. And let's start in verse 1. It says, Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man their, uh, of their coast, and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet, and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But the blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth, and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. You see what God's telling Ezekiel here about him being a watchman. That he as a watchman to Israel, that when he sees the sword coming, he's supposed to blow the trumpet and warn the people. And if they flee then they, their lives will be spared if they take heed to his warning, the warning of the watchman. But if they do not take heed to the warning of the watchman, well, then they're going to die in their own sin, their own iniquity. They didn't take heed to what the watchman said. But if he as a watchman sees the sword coming and does not warn them, 
If he does not blow the trumpet, well, they're going to die because of their own iniquity, but also their blood is going to be required at the watchman's hand because he didn't blow the trumpet, because he didn't sound the horn. And you know what? We here, as people who have believed in Jesus Christ and are ambassadors of Jesus Christ and know the truth, uh, God has left us here to be watchmen. We should be blowing the trumpet to all who can hear about the coming day of judgment, about uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, and if we're not, those people that God has put in our lives for us to be a witness to, uh, they're going to die in their own sins. Uh, but we're going to have blood on our hands if we didn't sound the trumpet, if we didn't do all we could to let the people that God has put in our lives uh, know of what's coming, know of the Savior. And, you know, that's we're not, as God's people, when we don't fully understand what's going on, like Habakkuk did there, uh, that doesn't give us license to leave our post. That doesn't give us our license to say, well, I don't get it. That things are getting hard. They're getting rough. I don't understand what God's doing. And so I'm just going to take a hiatus here. No, we've got, we've got to still man our post and man our watch. God should never be put on trial. You know, God is a God who always does what is right. And, you know, as a people of faith, that should be our attitude. That no matter what happens, we know that God always does right. And we might question and we might wonder what's going on, but that doesn't give us license to put God on trial or to quit the things that we know that we're supposed to be doing. Uh, we should just stay on our post and wait until God sorts it out for us and wait until we're reproved. Wait until we see where we're going wrong. And that's exactly uh, what Habakkuk is doing here, saying, I'm just going to stay on my watch. All right, let's continue back in Habakkuk chapter 2. Back of chapter 2, we'll go to verse 2. And the Lord's going to answer him. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon the tables that he may run that readeth it. Write the vision, make it plain upon the tables that he may run that readeth it. So now God's going to give him the vision. Uh, going to give him uh, the prophecy of what he wants him to write. But what I want to point out in this verse here is he says, Make it plain upon the tables that he may run that readeth it. Make it plain. Right? God wanted Habakkuk to plainly lay out and to clearly lay out as the watchman exactly the vision that God was going to give him to him. So that when they read it, they would understand and flee. Right? Don't sugarcoat it. Don't gloss it over. Don't leave anything out. Don't make it hard to understand. Make it plain. And you know what? We have God's vision. We have God's word right here. And when we are sounding the trumpet, when we're telling others, you know, we need to be reminded to make it plain. Uh, again, this is, a, is no, another thing that's a reminder to me as a pastor that as I preach the word, I need to make it plain. Uh, that doesn't mean we just have to be mean to people and just beat people over the head and talk over their head and be, you know, nasty to them. That's not what it's saying when it's saying make it plain. Uh, but we should just stand on the truth, own the truth that we know and not be ashamed of the truth uh, and just plainly and clearly tell it. You know, uh, the Apostle uh, Paul uh, in sending his letter to Timothy in 2 Timothy, he told him to preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all doctrine and long suffering. Because there's going to come a time when they're not going to listen to sound doctrine anymore. They're going to, people are going to be propping up to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And you know what? People are longing for truth right now. Uh, we can get so caught up and deceived uh, by Antichrist, by Satan, by the world, and thinking that. You know what? People just don't, they don't want it plain. You know, they, we've got to, we've got to dress it up some other way, right? We, like a, a guy was talking about the other, a few weeks ago, where he said, we have new, exciting way to present the gospel, right? We don't need that. We just need to make it plain. And there's people out there that are hungry for just the plain truth. Uh, I was, it was great. Robert was talking about the lady that he led to the Lord tonight, that she was just one, she was just waiting uh, for somebody to bring her the gospel, 
She was ready to hear. She was hungry for it. She just needed somebody to come and tell her to make it plain. Uh, just give it to her straight. And you know, we, again, as Christians, like we talked about this morning, we own the truth. Right? We haven't followed after cunningly devised fables. So having the truth and having the hope that we do, uh, we just need to make it plain. Uh, we don't have to dress it up. We don't have to dumb it down. We don't have to uh, cut corners or cut anything out or we don't have to shy away from it. Uh, we should be making it plain. Uh, you know, it's this whole political correctness in our world today is just it's killing us. People don't even know how to talk to each other anymore. Uh, you know, you just can't say what you're thinking. And, you know, sometimes it's not always a good idea to say everything that comes to your mind. Uh, you know, we should still be letting our speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Right? We're supposed to speak the truth in love. Again, I'm not saying any of these things to give us a license to just be a, be a jerk. Uh, but, you know what? We shouldn't just pussyfoot around the truth all the time. You know? We need to make it plain. Uh, if the Bible says that, well, these are God's words. There's no purer words than the words of God. You know, if you have a problem, just tell, just give them God's words. That's a good. That's a good reason to memorize scripture. And you know, that's a a lot of times how I've found that's the best way to really talk to people about difficult subjects and things is instead of trying to form it in my own words and try to find the best way to frame it. Uh, if the Holy Spirit brings me a scripture that I'm thinking about that kind of relates to what we're talking about. I'll just say, hey, you know, in this scripture, it says this and just quote the verse. And that's that's the best way to answer anybody, especially when you're talking about controversial things, because they're not my words. They're God's words and they're pure words. Those words are quick and powerful. Uh, they'll they'll do the work. Right. And so we just need to preach the word of the instant in season, out of season, make it plain. Uh, go with me to Second Corinthians, chapter three. Talking about making it plain. Second Corinthians. That's not Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter three. Second Corinthians chapter three. We'll start in verse twelve. And uh, to kind of give some context here, in this uh, section of the scripture, the Apostle Paul is talking about uh, the, the hope that they have in the New Testament, in the New Covenant. How in the letter of the law, that the law brought death, that the law killed, that the, uh, in the law they were all, they were all dead. That the children of Israel, they couldn't see to the end of things because they, they couldn't keep the law. They couldn't approach unto uh, Moses, when he went into the holy mountain, his face shone because of the glory of God, uh, because of the holiness of God, uh, because they couldn't be partakers of that holiness uh, by the law, uh, because the law was there to condemn. It showed them that they were sinners and that they uh, needed a savior. And so it's talking about now in the New Testament, now that Jesus has appeared in these last days, that he has uh, manifested salvation, that he is the way. Uh, to righteousness, how we can use great plainness of speech, having this hope in Jesus Christ. Uh, look what it says here in Second Corinthians chapter uh, three, verse twelve. It says, "Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was abolished." But their minds were blinded, for unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Look, with the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, we have liberty to, to plainly go out and preach the gospel. 
right? We have this great hope. There's no hope like we have in Jesus Christ and anything else in the world. Uh, why would we not want to go out and make it plain? Why do we have to? Why would we be worried about just openly telling people about how they can be saved and how they can have the gospel? Everything else, any hope in anything else other than Jesus Christ, it, those folks just have a veil on their face. They have a veil on their heart. Uh, the end of that is not life. The end of that is death. We had a lady yesterday that was shouting out bread across the driveway uh, that he should stop being a Christian. He should throw out the Old Testament. That Oh, the New Testament. Sorry, yeah. She, she said only read the Old Testament. She said throw out the New Testament. Uh, stop being a Christian and, and what live by the law or something like that, right? That lady has a veil on her heart. Uh, what hope is in that? Because I, I, I asked for it. Well, if, if she's counting upon the law to save her, uh, well, then where, does she do animal sacrifices? Uh, does she have some Levites in her backyard and a, a priest? She's not even following the law. Uh, so she can't be confident in her salvation and confident in seeing how the end of that's going to play out. She's got a veil on her face. She's got a veil on her heart. You know, but since we have such hope, we ought to use great plainness of speech. People need this hope. They need us to be preaching Jesus and to make it plain. All right, let's go back to Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2. Continuing on in verse 3. It says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. And I like what it says there. It says, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. But wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. So God's telling him here, look, this vision that I'm giving you, it's for an appointed time. It's going to be in the future. Uh, it's going to come, but wait, because it's going to speak, and it's not going to lie. And don't we, you should know that as Christians, that God's words don't lie. Right? Everything that's said in this book is going to come. It's going to happen. We just need to wait for it. You know, in the Psalms, in 27, 14, uh, Psalmist David says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Right? Are we waiting on the Lord? Are we looking to his promises and to the things that he says are going to come that they're not going to lie, that they are going to come, that they are going to happen? You know, uh, the scripture was mentioned, I think, on uh, Wednesday night. A day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day uh, with the Lord. Right? A lot of people... Uh, get discouraged and dismayed when all this stuff's happening. Saying, well, well, when's the second coming going to happen? It's been over 2,000 years, and uh, I, thought, I thought Jesus should be here by now, right? We know he's coming back because his word says it. You know, it's not going to lie. It's coming. And just as uh, the prophet Habakkuk, as he was given his vision, and God said, just wait for it. It's not going to lie. It's coming. The word of God is the same. And, you know, that will give us uh, peace and refuge uh, in a world of chaos. You know, when I see all these uh, things happen, especially all the lies and the injustices that are going on, especially here recently, uh, it can be very frustrating. But I, I like the verse in uh, Psalm 119, 165. It says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Look, when your peace, when your rest, when your hope, when your trust, when your truth is founded in the word of God, you know that everything he says is going to come to fruition. That you don't have to worry about any of the talking heads, any of the lying, any of the false reports on the internet. Uh, none of those will phase you or offend you because you know that it's coming, that it will not lie. Uh, go with me to 1 Samuel. I like uh, this phrase that um, is said in 1 Samuel about the prophet Samuel. Go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 3.
1 Samuel chapter 3, and this is at the beginning when uh, Samuel is living with Eli there, the priest, and this is right after uh, God uh, first speaks uh, to Samuel. And uh, look what it says there in verse 18. It says, And Samuel told him every whit, so Eli uh, asked, he, he prodded at uh, Samuel, asking him what the Lord had spoken to him about. He wanted to know. And so Samuel told him everything. That's what it says there in verse 18. And Samuel told him every whit and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. But you see what it said there in verse 19. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. God didn't let any of the words, any prophecy that Samuel spoke fall to the ground. Everything that Samuel said was true uh, in the name of the Lord. And God didn't let any of it fall to the ground so that all of Israel knew that he was a prophet. That he was a prophet of God. And you know what? None of these words are going to fall to the ground. Look, if you don't want any of your words to fall to the ground, make them God's words. Because none of these words are going to fall to the ground. No, we can have peace and rest in knowing that, and making plain to people the word of God, knowing that none of these words are going to fall to the ground. Every one of them are going to come to pass. And I just like that phrase there. That was great. All right, let's go back to Habakkuk. Habakkuk, chapter 2. In verse 4, it says, Behold, God is saying, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not right upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. And so remember, Habakkuk was asking why, why God would use the Chaldeans, why God would use those that are more unrighteous to judge a people that are more righteous than them. And the Lord says here, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Now, anybody that says in the Old Testament that uh, people were saved by their works, and now it's changed in the New Testament, I guess they didn't read Habakkuk. Because here in Habakkuk, we have a, a famous verse of the Scripture that's quoted three times in the New Testament. The just shall live by faith. You know, that word just or justified, it means to be declared righteous. You know, so you can put the righteous shall live by faith. You know, uh, you're not declared righteous, but by faith. No one is ever declared righteous by their works. And I like the contrast here, how he's mentioning here in the middle of mentioning, you know, an unrighteous man, a proud man. Uh, behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright. Uh, he lifts, he mentions the righteous, the just shall live by faith. You ask yourself, why is he doing that there? Because look, anybody that's seeking uh, eternal life any other way is proud. Uh, they're proud, and they're going to be dead in trespasses and sins. Uh, the only way to live is by faith. The only way to have life is by faith. The just shall live by his faith. Uh, and again, he's reminding Habakkuk here that, look, this nation that I'm bringing up against you, they're... He's not going to live by their proud boasting, by devouring all these nations. Uh, only the just are going to live by faith. And I want to go to uh, the three other mentions of this scripture in the New Testament. Let's go to the first mention in uh, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Get there. This page is just sticking in there. Romans chapter 1 will be in verse, we'll start in verse uh, start 16. The 
Apostle Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. There's no question you're only living by faith. It says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. You know, the righteousness of God given to man is only given by faith. The just shall live by his faith. Uh, let's go to Galatians. That's another mention of this uh, scripture in Galatians chapter 3. Another time where this Habakkuk is quoted in Galatians chapter 3. In verse 10 it says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. You see, the law brings a curse because you have to abide by every rule of that law in order to have life by the law. Nobody's been able to do that. Uh, but in verse 11 it says, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. Now, I went and reading this, and I think it was back in Romans, um, I've heard it mentioned many times. I don't know much about him, but I guess there was a famous reformer named Martin Luther uh, who was actually a Catholic priest, and he was sent to Rome for, I can't remember, I don't even remember the story, but he was sent to Rome for something. There was some kind of injustice, something going wrong in the Catholic Church there. And when he got there, he was just disgusted. He thought he was going to Rome, you know, the capital of, you know, Roman Catholicism, that this was going to be a holy city. Uh, and when he got there, he was just astounded at the fact that it was worse than any city he'd ever been in, that there was just sin and idolatry and wickedness just at every turn. And he was doing, well, again, one of these Catholic traditions where he was walking up the steps of Pilate, I think on his knees, paying penance, um, as he has all these thoughts in his mind. And he had read, I think, earlier in Romans, that scripture that we just quoted, the just shall live by faith. And I think he was uh, praying to God about, you know, just revealing things to him. And he said, I think three times. That phrase, the just shall live by faith, popped in his head. And that's what spawned him to become a, a protest the Catholic Church and actually try to reform the Catholic Church and realizing that they weren't teaching that the just shall live by faith, that they were teaching works for salvation. And I, he became a, a reformer for, I think, the, well, the Lutherans. I think that's where we get the Lutheran Church. Uh, but obviously he didn't he didn't do a real good job of reforming everything but he at least understood that the just shall live by faith and that was one of the scriptures and I, I don't see how anybody wouldn't see that in just reading their Bible and that's exactly why we need to speak the scriptures and make them plain and be watching because there's a lot of folks out there like the Catholics who call themselves Christians um, who have no clue that you live by faith and not by your works, because nobody's ever told them. Uh, they haven't ever read that scripture. It's never been made plain to them. But it couldn't be more plain in reading the scriptures that the just shall live by faith. Uh, one last time, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. And we'll close on this one. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 38, Hebrews 10, 38. It says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe 
to the saving of the soul. Now in this uh, scripture, to get the context, again, it's in Hebrews, like we've talked about many times, it's telling us a lot of the things that change from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. And one of those is uh, sacrifices. That Jesus, he's the sacrifice. He's the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. All those other sacrifices were a picture of Jesus Christ and the blood that he would shed on the cross for us. And so once Jesus Christ came and uh, that lamb was manifested to the world, uh, there are no more sacrifices for sins. Uh, they don't offer those sacrifices because the one sacrifice to satisfy all sin uh, was made by Jesus Christ. And so earlier in the scripture, it's talking about those who would try to bring the law into Christianity, about those who would uh, be offering sacrifices for sin after the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that for them, that would be like counting the blood of Jesus Christ, like trodden in and under the foot of man. Uh, go earlier in the scripture, it says uh, in verse uh, 26, in chapter 10, verse 26, it says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Look, after we've received the knowledge of the truth and been saved, uh, if we commit sin after that, there's no more sacrifice for sin. Jesus is one sacrifice in the blood that he shed. It covers all past, present, and future. There's no more sacrifices for sins. And people say, well, this is talking about, you know, if we sin willfully, you know, this is a presumptuous sin. This is a special kind of sin. What sin is not willful? Think about that. What sin is not willful? I mean, pretty much all sin is willful. Nobody's holding a gun to your head and saying, you know, commit this sin. All sin is willful. All right. So if we commit sin after we've received knowledge of the truth, uh, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Jesus has made that one and final sacrifice, but a certain fearful looking for of the judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under the foot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath that's done despite under the spirit of grace. Look, somebody that would be looking to offer sacrifice in addition to what Jesus already offered would be trodden underfoot the Son of God and the sacrifice that he made. Uh, there is no other sacrifice that needs to be made. We continue reading in verse 30. It says, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproach and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and endurance a substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Look, and thinking that you have to go back to the law and offer sacrifice will be casting away your confidence. You know, the confidence that are going to get us through these great trial of afflictions, the confidence that we have that Jesus has paid it all, that we're saved, our home in heaven is sealed. It says in verse 36, for ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Again, like, it, like we're talking about, yet a little while he's going to come and not tarry. Look, the promise is for a set time. Wait for it. It'll come. It says, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul hath no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back into perdition, but of them that believe unto the saving of the soul. He's talking about those that draw back to the law, that draw back to relying upon their salvation by their works, by animal sacrifices, by doing the things that were in the Old Testament that Jesus has come and fulfilled. And again, we can see that now the just shall live by faith. Look, it takes faith 
to be saved, to be justified, but again, a living uh, and waiting for the promises that God has given to us and knowing that God is going to fulfill all these visions that he's given to us of future things, uh, it takes faith. You know, the just are going to live by their faith. You know, those that are looking for another way or going their own way or, you know, they don't understand so they're forsaking God's way, right? They're proud. Uh, they're going to fall to the ground. God's words never fall to the ground. Uh, we just have to keep living by faith, stay on our post, stay on our watch, and just wait. Um, now, when we go back to Habakkuk, we're not going to go further in any of the other scriptures, but what we're going to see next week is then now God is going to pronounce uh, five woes, five woes upon uh, the Chaldeans, this hasty nation that he talks about in chapter one. So next week, we're going to go over the five woes uh, that God uh, pronounces upon the Chaldeans. Uh, let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Father, uh, Lord, I just thank you for your word.